And joining us now, Dr. Gabor Matei. He is the author of, most recently, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction. It's nice to have you back at TVO. Pleasure. You've been Thank on you. this channel a lot. I guess people are very interested in both you and this topic. Not surprising. You're a physician who treats patients who have serious addictions to some of the most illicit drugs going. So you're a good person to ask this first question of, what's the cause of addiction? You know, in medicine, it's, um, it's a mistake to try and ascribe the things just to one cause. But if there's one single major cause, dominant cause, then the major cause of severe substance addiction is always childhood trauma. Childhood trauma. Yeah, not just according to my experience. And my experience is that I don't have anybody in the downtown east side of Vancouver where I work who wasn't abused as a child, not even by accident, and all the women were sexually abused specifically. Mm -hmm. But also going to all the research uh, that uh, the more adverse childhood experiences a person has, the exponentially greater the likelihood of substance abuse later on. So those who say it's all hereditary, you say what? That is nonsense. Nonsense? Yeah, yeah. Genes um, may have some predisposing role, but predispositions are not the same as predeterminations. I mean, now I know that genes are actually turned on and off by the environment. There was a study a couple of weeks ago that came out that showed that even people who have a predisposition to addiction genetically, that gene is turned off if they receive good nurturing parenting. But we hear all the time, if your dad was an alcoholic, chances are you will be too. Sure, and under what conditions do you grow up if your, parents, if your father was an alcoholic? In other words, how is that trait passed on? Is it passed on genetically or is it passed on uh, through the fact that you had stressful early experiences? And even if you were adopted, you still have stressful experiences because your mother was stressed for nine months. And we already know that stress on the, on the parturient woman, on the pregnant woman, has an impact on the child's development and on the child's stress levels. And then, of course, there's the separation from the birth mother. So whether you look at adoption studies or straight family linear histories, just because a parent is addicted uh, and the child becomes an addict as well, says nothing about genetic causation. Okay, but it, it, it must go beyond childhood trauma as well. If, even if you had a blessed childhood, but you've had some extraordinary thing happen to you as an adult, you can get addicted as well, can you not? Highly unlikely. Uh, what we know about the human brain now is that it's actually shaped by the early environment, that the physiology and the chemistry of the brain is in fact physiologically under the uh, influence of the early environment so that those circuits are either set up or not set up fairly early in life. Nobody who had a blessed childhood becomes an addict. Some people think they had a blessed childhood, but that's only because they haven't looked at what actually didn't work in their childhood. Hmm. Some people have terrible life experiences and they do not become addicted to drugs. Other people do overcome their addictions despite the fact they have that's terrible true. childhoods. So where does willpower factor into all of this? Willpower is a difficult question to discern because if you actually look at the circuits in the brain that make conscious decisions, they're very weak. And they're much dominated by our impulses, which come from deeper brain centers. And the gap between an impulse and a decision is only a split second. Hmm. So when you actually look at people who had a lot of negative experiences, but they didn't become addicts, first of all, addiction is not the only outcome. A lot of people compensate for terrible early experiences by becoming, quote, really, really good people. And they end up making themselves ill because they repress so much. And I've written a book about that as well. Other people may have had terrible experiences, but they may have had an opportunity to process it. Maybe there was a sympathetic witness in their lives with whom they could share and at least emotionally resolve the trauma. Then they don't need to become addicts. But the people overwhelmingly who become severe substance users are people that were traumatized early and had nobody there to help them process the experience. What percentage of your patients would you guess overcome their addictions? Of my patients in the downtown east side? Mm -hmm. In Vancouver, yes. Yeah, if, if, I, if I could say 5%, I'd be hailed as an international genius. It'd be less than that. Less than 5%? Oh, yeah, and that's, just not, that's not only my statistics, that's generally true across the board. However, the question is why not? What keeps them? And that's where we have to come into our society, how it treats the addict, how it views the addict, and how it punishes the addict. In the context of what we have right now, social exclusion, ostracization, and this war on drugs, all we're doing is entrenching tens of thousands of people in heavily addictive behaviors. In other words, we don't have the context to heal or to redeem people. We just don't have it. They say in baseball, if you're a hitter and you fail seven times out of ten, you're a star. Because mm -hmm. you're still getting three hits out of ten. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that you're not having success with more than 95% of your patients, but you're still doing really well by, by the yardstick of your profession? Is that right? 
I'm not saying I'm doing really well. I'm saying I'm doing what I'm doing. Under the present situation, the way it's set up with this war on drugs, and incidentally, there's no war on drugs. You can't war on inanimate objects. What there is is a war on drug addicts. When there's a war on drug addicts, uh, it's very difficult to save anybody. What I do is I treat people's illnesses. I reduce the harm of their addictions and of the social attitude towards addiction. If I wanted to redeem and cure a lot more people, I need a lot more behind me. I need rehabilitation homes. I need this uh, insane and uh, counterproductive war to come to an end. I need resources not up, are not put into uh, into uh, jail facilities and police work to go into treatment. We need a lot more. In other words, we could, we could do a lot more. So in the present context, our failure rate is high if by failure we, we define that people give up their addictions. There must be a broad spectrum, though, of obsession or of compulsion, however you want to describe yeah. this. Every, I mean, at one end, I guess, it's you pick up your Blackberry too often. At the other end, you're mainlining heroin yeah. you know, five times a day or whatever. Uh, given that broad spectrum, are you an addict of something? Well, that's the whole point. In our, our society is based on addictive behaviors. Now, I, I define as an addictive behavior as a compulsive repetition of behaviors that give you temporary pleasure and relief in the long term create problems and negative consequences, but you still persist and you still relapse. Now, by that definition, yes, I've had addictive behaviors to work with negative consequences on my family, on the, on the upbringing of my children, on their, on their emotional health. I've had negative uh, attachment to purchasing classical compact music where I spend a lot of money, ignore my family, and, uh, and lie. You, you went out one weekend and blew eight grand on CDs, right? The truth is out, I did. Yeah, and that was, wasn't a conscious choice. In other words, it's not that I woke up Monday morning and I said, hey, what should I spend this $8,000 on? It's more like I just had to keep going back and going back. 30% of Canadians now define themselves as workaholics between ages of 19 and 65, according to StatsCan. And that means they're listless and irritable when they're not at work. Their mind is on the work. They're not with their families. All kinds of negative consequences, but that's how they soothe their sense of emptiness and dissatisfaction. Some of the most creative wonderfulness, though, comes out of addictive behavior. Would you not agree with that? No. You don't agree? I think there's a difference between passion and addiction. You can be passionate about something, devoted to it, but be conscious and be aware and be mindful and be in charge of it. In the addiction, it's the addiction that's in charge. You are driven. You're not in charge. You're not in the driver's seat. That always has negative consequences. Now, it may be that some good stuff comes out of that, but the negative always outweighs the bad, mm. the, the good. Do you discuss your own compulsive behavior or addiction, whatever you want to call it, with your patients? I do. They know about it? Oh, yeah, sure they know about it. In fact, they laugh and they shake their heads and they say, oh, yeah, I get it. You know, I mean, they, they totally get it. It, it, it. You know, it's qualitatively, it's the same thing. Quantitatively, it's not. They're far worse, but they've suffered a lot more than I ever have had. So mm -hmm. their need for soothing is much greater. And, and I've also had fewer advantages in terms of education and, and stable upbringing than I've had. But do you ever get them saying, you know, given your own troubles with addiction, who are you to tell us or give us advice with how to, how to live our lives? No, on the contrary. What they say is it's nice to talk to somebody who actually gets it, Got and, it. And, and doesn't see himself as somehow superior. Okay. You work, as you've told us, in Vancouver's downtown east side, which some people have described as kind of the poorest postal code in the whole country. Yeah. And here's how you describe it in your book. Let's do an excerpt here. Not that we lack real infestation in the downtown east side. Rodents thrive between hotel walls and in the garbage-strewn back alleys. Vermin populate many of my patients' beds, clothes, and bodies. Bed bugs, lice, scabies. Cockroaches occasionally drop out from shaken shirts and pant legs in my office and scurry for cover under my desk. Now, this neighborhood can't always have been like that. How did it turn into that? Well, you know, um, actually, I found out today that uh, the filmmaker uh, Alan King uh, did a film on the Skid Row area of Vancouver in 1957. Hmm. So it's been like that for a long time. What, what you have in Vancouver is uh, a preponderance of relatively cheap housing and, the, and reasonable climate. And so Vancouver has become the receptacle, really, of the uh, dysfunction that's generated across the country. But because of climate and because of the, the cheap housing available in that part of the world, we have this heavy concentration of addicted people. And, of course, 
then services come in to support these people because they have to be supported, they have to be served, you have to feed people, look after them. And then, given the lack of services elsewhere in the country, in fact, the negative and, and uh, ostracizing attitudes that people experience elsewhere, where else would they congregate except with others of their own kind, where they have a kind of community which for all its dysfunction at least gives them a sense of belonging and to some degree security. Mm. Uh, you are trying to provide a service for some of the most unfortunate people in society, but my hunch is the people in the rest of Vancouver are not that enamored with having this community in its midst. How does that manifest itself in your life? Well, people don't like it for two reasons. Some people just on a humane level believe that we ought to do better than to ghettoize people like the way we have in Vancouver is down to any side. Some people don't like it because it looks bad. For example, it makes the Olympic City, it takes the glow, the glitter off our sense of Vancouver being this great place to live. And so they want to make changes for that reason. Although the uh, city's mothers and fathers say they're, they're planning to do something about this part of the city now because the Olympics are coming. Yeah, isn't that nice? Is it? Well, the, it's nice that they want to do something. I don't care why people want to do it as long as they actually provide some decent services and housing. On the other hand, for decades now, they've been starving the area of, of, of housing uh, support. So that, you know, um, are we doing it to look good or are we doing it because we're humane? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Do, do you care what the, what the reason is as long as it gets done? I do care because the, if, if we do it because we're committed to being humane, that's going to carry on. If we're only doing it to look good, then once the camera is off us, we're going to stop it. But do you believe the city mothers and fathers when they say it's now a priority of ours to cl help clean up this area? I think there are many people in Vancouver politics who are very sincere about that, and I think that crosses the political spectrum, blessedly so. What's the Portland Hotel? The Portland Hotel is a um, domicile for the most unhousable of Vancouver's downtown east side people. Uh, the average person staying at the place, it's not a hotel actually, uh, it's just called that. The average person there would have had five or six addresses in the previous 12 months prior to being admitted there. So people have been given housing, medical services. My clinic has been in, uh, in that facility for the last 10 years. Uh, their medications are given out to them in the morning. And we're trying to mitigate the effect of the harshness of their lives and the harshness of social ostracization. Have you yet figured out what it is about you? You're a medical doctor, right? You yeah. can make a fortune doing anything else. Yeah. Not a fortune. You can make a good living doing yeah. anything else. What is it about these kinds of people and that location and this world that draws you there? Well, you, you know, that's always a complex question because there's always a combination of conscious and unconscious that motivates any of us. But uh, as far as I can tell with myself, it's I do have a genuine commitment to working with people who suffer. That's why I went into medicine in the first place. And I have a very clear sense that some people suffer for no fault of their own. For, uh, no, nobody at age three has to be sexually abused. Then I resonate. I mean, I get that I'm very similar to them, so something pulls me there. And, and then it's a very authentic place to work. I mean, people may lie and they cheat, but they don't pretend to be other than who they are. That's a rough crowd, though. I don't have to tell you. I mean, I'm, having read about it in your book, you are dealing with some very tough people who've gone through awful things. and You know, they're very sweet people. They're very sweet, warm, humorous people who have an immeasurable capacity for loving responses if they're giving the opening for that. That's, that's what's behind that veneer of toughness. There's actually a lot of vulnerability. Yeah, that, that's, but, how, that's how it is. But manipulative too, though, right? But who isn't? Okay. <laughs> you know, Fair enough. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I can be manipulative sometime. Uh, uh, your friends or partners may tell you that you, you can be that way. These people are manipulated because they're weak. They're in a weak position. The weak has to manipulate. That's taken for granted. But that's not unique to them in any way at all. Just finally, I, I presume you have two different kinds of days. There are the days where you wake up and you say, you know, if not for me, these people would fall off the edge of the world because yeah. nobody cares about them. And then I guess there are days where you wake up and you think, you know, I, I could work 80 hours a day, never mind 24, it wouldn't, and, it wouldn't and, be enough. and it wouldn't be enough and I'm not making the kind of progress I wish I were. What, what do you have more days of? Oh, uh, many more of the first kind of days of not where I think that if but for me they would fall off, but, but certainly but for the kind of work that's being done on there, including by myself these people would suffer a lot more and that makes it really worthwhile. So you do feel you're having an impact? Yes, you have an impact on people because uh, you're giving them something that otherwise they'd never get. 
which is, uh, again, it's not personal to me. I'm talking about the work itself, not, mm -hmm. not me. But uh, acceptance, non-judgment, uh, compassionate response to their suffering, uh, practical help. But for the people that work down there, these people would not be getting that. And all that would happen is that their early trauma would be revisited upon them daily uh, till the end of their lives, which is largely what happens anyway, but at least be mitigated to some degree. Understood. The book is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction. Gabor Matei, good to have you here at TVO tonight. My pleasure. Thank you.